Okay, so uh, this week we're going to look at subsidence and some earth fissures. And so subsidence is a general term that we're going to use to describe um, the kind of the vertical deflation of the land surface for a variety of reasons. And a lot of times it's subtle, it just happens slowly over time. We talked a little bit about this with some, some groundwater issues. But uh, it's not always caused by groundwater withdrawal. We can certainly have it from pulling oils and natural gas out of the ground. It can happen um, suddenly when you have a sinkhole develop or something like that. And certainly here in Arizona, we get features called earth fissures that occur. And in some areas, it just naturally subsides. So in areas where there's a delta, and we would use the example of, let's say, the Mississippi River. As it flows into the Gulf there, it's dumping a ton of sediment that slowly builds up and be, can become land surface. But over time, that material compacts and will slowly sink. But additional flooding usually brings more material in, and it can kind of have this kind of happy medium where it stays above sea level. But without flooding, then they don't replenish the soils and the land surface slowly subsides. And so certainly places like New Orleans that live or built on a delta or delta deposits are actually slowly sinking over time. And so we can look at those things and figure out, you know, what's going on and try to identify places where we have subsidence like that. So. What we could talk about when we talk about subsidence is just this generally this sinking of the land surface here. But it can happen for a variety of reasons, like we talked about dissolution. So we dissolve some rocks. So a limestone is a rock that is dissolved over time from slightly acidic water, which can be groundwater, rainwater. It takes sometimes thousands of years for that to happen. But a lot of times that dissolution is happening at depth and where there's cavities that you can't see and then suddenly they will collapse and then you'll get a sinkhole. And certainly we can get that from um, removing groundwater and fluids like that. And even issues with the ground level changing as uh, water in the soils freeze and thaw. So we have movement up and down like that. And so a lot of times it's not a life-threatening thing like uh, let's say a tsunami wave coming in smashing into your house or an earthquake breaking it down sometimes it can be subtle a slow kind of compaction of material where land surface slowly sinks probably the most dramatic would be a sinkhole that we would see for some hazard like this and so when we look at some examples of where we have sinking land surfaces you can see that coastal sediments is a pretty big one here these are these deltaic deposits, right? And so, you know, meters of subsidence, you know, that's not bad, three meters, that's 10 feet. Now it doesn't give you over time, like how long that's taken. And usually it would take, you know, maybe, in some places it can be dramatic where you can lose land surface, you know, maybe six inches a year. So this might be over 10 or 15 years. It can impact a large area, but you can see that withdrawing oil, groundwater withdrawal, and things like that all lead to this kind of sinking of the land surface here. And so some terms we can throw out for areas that kind of slowly sink down or areas that are um, kind of prone to these caverns, collapse features, is areas that have a high amount of limestone or evaporite deposits. And so what happens in those areas, because they're so susceptible to dissolution, you get what's called a karst topography. It's just a general term to describe an area that has these features that you see in that little diagram there. So the subsidence feature of sinking land and dissolving land and collapse features, that whole general area would be called a karst topography. And it would be related to the type of geology that exists there as opposed to extraction of groundwater or oil or things like that. And here in Arizona, there's actually some karst topography that exists. It's up in the northern part of the state. You can see Flagstaff here. And so this is an area where there's limestone at depth here, and that limestone was dissolved. A little caverns have formed, and we get some collapse features that are showing up there where the limestone or gypsums or salt deposits that can be easily dissolved show up. 
So we get some of those features there because of the geology there. The other thing that we see that is kind of more dramatic would be sinkholes. And sinkholes are usually caused by groundwater moving up and down. So usually this happens over long periods of time. But the idea is that the material that the water is in has to be slightly uh, dissolvable in water. And this is usually limestone. Like you said, it could be gypsum deposits and salt deposits, but limestone is super common. And what happens as the groundwater table moves up and down, it's moving its way through the limestone, fractures and cracks within the limestone. And over time, it enlarges those cracks and fractures. And eventually, they can become a cave system where we can get kind of pockets or holes or caves in the subsurface that can't be seen. If they're close to the surface, they can collapse if we build on top of them or there's weight or there's a sudden withdrawal of groundwater. And so certainly sinkholes are the more dramatic kind of hazard that we see when we talk about subsidence. Here's kind of a quick little diagram. The idea is that this would be all limestone. There'd be some erosion happening, so we get some dirt and soil on top. So you might not know that there's a cave down here, and that cave might be filled with water if the water table is really high. Now, if we pull the water out of the cave, now there's just air in here. So the water was acting as a, a support to keep the cave open. If we remove the water, now it's just air and it can more easily collapse, especially if we're building on top of here. And you can go to the USGS. I think there's a link in the lecture part here that gives you a little more information about that. So you can check that out. And this is how a lot of cave systems are created is the material that the caves are in is usually some type of limestone and is caused by dissolution over long periods of time and of course you can precipitate that limestone back out because it's being dissolved so it's in the water the water flows somewhere and then it drips out and then you can recrystallize it and you get stalactites and stalagmites and things like that but the overall opening is usually from this dissolution as the water moves through the limestone and so there's examples of big caves, obviously, if you've been to uh, Carlsbad Caverns or even down to Karchner Cavern, which is down south near Tucson there. Not all of it is from limestone, but a lot of it is at least initially developed and there's some collapse features and things like that. So a lot of big systems there. And as the water table now has dropped below that level, now it's available for us to go in and see. All right, let's see. And then we go here. Let's go here. So it's a few other karst features, features that you would see in this area where there's a lot of limestone, remember. Sometimes you get these resistant blocks that don't dissolve like the others, and so they kind of pop out like this, where the rest of the material has been dissolved. This is over hundreds of thousands of years you would get kind of surface like this. In areas where there is a lot of limestone, sometimes you get disappearing streams because they're flowing on the surface and then they find a cavity or a fracture and they flow down into it and they end up in the maybe that cave system. Or springs that kind of just pop up when you're hiking around, all of a sudden you see water flowing out from the ground. Same thing, the water is moving between the surface and the subsurface because there's open space beneath your feet there and that's due to the limestone that exists there. And so other ways that we can get the land surface to lower down, you can have these three kind of examples here. And a term we use called thermokarst is really related to uh, the cold weather. So water that's frozen within the soil causes soils to sometimes upheave or if they melt to deflate. And then we can also get sediment compaction, which I mentioned early on. That's just a natural phenomenon that where you deposit a lot of material over time, it's going to compact down. And then we have some weird stuff called expansive soil. So there's some soils that actually absorb water. And so we have some here in Arizona in the Chinle Formation, which is up on the Colorado Plateau. And so if you've been up to that area, it's kind of by uh, the little Colorado River. The road is just moves up and down, it seems like. It's because the, the, the soil there, the material is made of this clay and the clay actually when it rains will absorb some of that water and expand and then when it dries out it'll shrink and this expansion and shrinking is causing the the roads to be damaged and things like that and although 
not very dramatic, these two here are probably the more expensive things that happen because they cover large areas. You know, they don't make your house collapse into a hole, but they crack your foundation or the sidewalk or the roadways. And, and because it covers a large area, you know, they have to fix all those things and it can cause a lot of damage. So thermocarsh, real quick, we'll go into that. Permafrost exists in some areas. That's just an area that the, the water that's in the soil is frozen permanently. And so for at least two years, it stays that way. But if we have a change in temperature, so we can again get the land to sink because as the water melts, it takes up less space. It actually has the ability to flow away. The land or the soils are not as hard now. And so if you have stuff built on them, they start to crack and subside and tilt and collapse. And so this thawing or freezing of soils can cause the land surface to change in elevation and cause damage. So. You know, today, as temperatures seem to increase around the world in places that had permafrost, where you could rely on it being a hard, solid surface and build something on it, now it's starting to melt. And of course, then it's causing the land surface to, to buckle and, and sink down, and then your structure gets damaged and things like that. And then uh, other places where it's temporary, where you have water in the, the soil close to the surface, and then it gets very cold and freezes that when the water freezes it takes up more space it expands and so it can heave up the ground and of course if you're not your home or structure isn't built properly when that happens that can cause damage because the land surface is changing and then we mentioned sediment compaction this is almost always related to some type of water deposit so we talked about the mississippi river delta places where there's delta deposits because in the geologic past there was tons of material being dumped there and as long as there's flooding periodically then we can kind of build that up build that up and then we come along and build on it but we don't want it to flood anymore so by putting dams in and restricting flooding we no longer nourish that area and so the compaction kind of just takes over and the land surface starts to sink and so you know, there's not a lot of things you can do about that unless you have some type of controlled flooding that you can kind of initiate so that the land surface doesn't constantly sink. I uh, mentioned expansive soils really fast. And so uh, this, like I said, we have an example up in northern Arizona. And these are these uh, clay rich soils that just basically produce uh, or absorb lots of water when it rains. And so they can expand. And then when they dry out, they shrink. And so we have this changing land surface that Obviously, you can you can see how that can affect structures like the other types of things. And, you know, just like the, the permafrost, this is kind of the things you get. It's not dramatic, but it's enough that it causes damage. And over time, that needs to re be repaired, of course. And then we talked about groundwater removal before, but just so, you know, talking about it again, it's probably one of the more dramatic ones that we can see. And there's a couple images like the one here. Um, where there's places in the San Joaquin Valley where there's been so much water depletion that as you remove the fluid from those open spaces, then the, the sediment compacts down. And there's been drops of up to, you know, 25 feet in certain areas. Now, most of this is, you know, and it takes some time, maybe 50 years. So maybe that's six inches a year. So it's not like you could watch it just collapse, but most of this is is areas that are farmland so there's not a lot of structures here that are getting damaged but now that people are more aware of it so it's becoming something that they're trying to control and uh you know there's that little uh, uh video you watched about uh california that talked about how the land surface was dropping there and so it is a problem and as we kind of maintain our groundwater, try to figure out how much to pull out, how much to put in, we have to be aware of this idea that the land surface could sink if we pull too much out and don't put much back in. And just here's some diagrams that show that idea that the open space between the uh, pieces here are being supported by the water. When we pull the water out, then given some time, now it doesn't happen instantly, but given some time, the weight of the overlying material can compact down and we lose that open space. And so two things that are occurring here, one is you're lowering the land surface, which obviously is bad, but you're also decreasing the porosity. 
So if I don't replenish this in a reasonable amount of time and this collapses, then I can't put water back in here because I've lost those open space. So you lose the ability of the aquifer to hold water. So that's definitely a problem. And then, of course, here in Arizona, we have something called earth fissures. Now, earth fissures happen other places, but we don't really get huge amounts of subsidence here. But we get what are called earth fissures. And these are fractures that show up on the land surface. And it's really because the ground is settling unevenly. So the idea here is we live in a big basin. So we have sediment that washed off the mountains into this basin and filled it up with sediment. So sands and gravels and muds and all those things. And some of those can hold water. So as it rains, it sinks down to the ground and it fills up those spaces. And we have this great groundwater here in Arizona. But that basin at the bottom isn't like a flat bowl. It's very irregular. So it has some highs and lows. And when we start to pull water out, the land, the sediment there sinks, but it doesn't all sink at the same rate. So it sinks faster in one area and slower in the other. Well, the surface, in order to accommodate that, basically cracks open. And so we can get these fissures here. And so there's a video you can watch of this earth fissure that someone took recently here in Arizona. I link you to the Arizona Geological Survey page and the lecture notes so you can kind of take a look at that too. So it's a hazard that is more common as you get closer to the edge of the basin. There's not so many here in the main part of the basin, which is where kind of Phoenix area, Tempe area is. But as you move out toward Apache Junction and you move south to Santan, you get more earth fissures because they're closer to the edge of the basin and the compaction is more pronounced there. And of course, there's a lot of agriculture out there, so they use a lot of water. And so they've removed much more water out that way. And so in part of your lab, you're actually going to look at some of this, but here's some areas that show some earth fissures that have been identified. And you can kind of see how here in the middle here of the basin, there's not as many identified. Now, some of that can be that they've been covered up. And so certainly this has all been developed. So if there was an earth fissure here, it's probably filled in, plowed over, and built homes on it. That's starting to happen out in this area here. And so it's been a problem in a few places where people would find earth fissures on property, not really know what they are, just plow them over and fill them in, and then build over them. But that's not the solution to the earth fissure because as we keep pumping water, that fissure will reopen. So there's been some instances where homes have had cracked foundations and driveways and things like that because an earth fissure was there and wasn't properly taken care of. But as we come here to the south, you can see there's a lot more for probably both those reasons. One, it's toward the edge of the basin. Two, a lot of agriculture, so a lot of water removal. And three, there's not as much construction, and so they haven't really been covered yet. So what are areas that we are concerned about for all this kind of subsidence thing, right? So, of course, it depends on certain things, but water removal is a big one. It almost affects almost everything we've talked about here. So if you remove a lot of water in deltaic areas, you're going to accelerate the compaction. If you move a, remove a lot of water in basins, you're going to cause subsidence. You're going to cause earth fissures. You can even cause sinkholes to occur if you pull the water table below the cave system and you take away the water that supports that open space. And then it's just air in there, which can cause the collapse of that cave system. And so that's a big one, but certainly if you live in an area with lots of limestone, so Florida, as you look at the lab this week, you'll see is just, it's pockmarked with sinkholes because most of Florida is composed of limestone is the bedrock there. And as the water has been rising and falling there, you get dissolution of the rocks, development of these caves or small little holes, and they collapse over time. And so certainly areas that have those soluble materials are at risk. Soils, the different soils that, that are problematic. So if you live in an area where you have these expansive soils, that's a problem. And then, of course, there's this freeze-thaw problem. So some places like here in Arizona, we don't have to worry about that, right? Because we don't really run into that. But areas where you either have a change in temperature dramatically or where you have permafrost, that can be a problem for sure.
And so these are the areas you want to be concerned about if you're going to buy a home or do things like that, or you're going to consider, you know, where you might be at risk for subsidence. If we look just at karst, so we're talking we're talking bedrock problems here, right? So limestone issues. You can see that there's a lot of this green area here are areas where there's limestone bedrock. And those areas have slowly been dissolved over long periods of time. And so the potential for collapse features sinkholes exists in those areas. And then for Arizona in particular, where do we see a lot of subsidence? Well, we see it in these little red areas here where we have, if you look at the data, the most water withdrawal. And so that's the big problem here in Arizona is the land surface is sinking slowly because we're pulling more water out than we're putting back in. And these areas are also prone to earth fissures. So subsidence is just the land surface sinking down slowly. And of course the earth fissures are the cracks or fractures that we also see that are related to that. And so how do we fix it? Well, if we argue that water is a big problem, water withdrawal is a big problem, then we have to kind of have some rules about how much water we can pull out or how much oil or how much things that we're pulling out of the, the, the ground, if we can manage our, our water input and output, then maybe we can reduce some of that kind of collapsing or subsidence that we see. Mining tends to do some of these things, problems, because of course, if we're digging underground, we can create collapse features. We didn't talk about that too much. Um, you know, engineering, how we build things, if we're talking about permafrost and how we get around that, you know, having supports that go deep into the ground below the permafrost so that they're not affected by the the permafrost melting and things like that. For the deltaic areas where we just have this general compaction, we could argue that if we could have some controlled flooding where we rebuild some of these areas with the material that comes from flooding where we get, you know, muds and soils come out, that that potentially could help. Um, and then, you know, once again, we go back to, you know, construction, how, how we build things for anything that the soils are going to expand and contract, you know, if we can keep water away from them. Sometimes we can even remove some of those soils. If they're not very deep, they can be removed before we build our structure. And so, you know, we have to determine the fix by what the hazard is that we see, whether it's the geology, the rock type there, or if it's something like water or it's something that we have to use a engineering solution to, right? And so um, in some cases, you know, wh what do we do when we're looking for hazards? Well, we, we map. I mean, almost for everything that we talk about, we say that if we can make a map and identify the hazardous areas, that's a helpful tool. Okay, we're mapping faults for earthquakes. We're mapping, you know, lahar zones for volcanoes. We're mapping flooding areas for floods. So we can map soil types, rock types, these things can help us determine areas that are problematic. And if we can't find a solution to them, then we say, well, maybe we don't build in these areas or we make them some other access area that doesn't hold uh, structures or things like that. And then for sinkholes, like I said, here in Arizona, it's not a big problem, but in places like Florida, it can be a large problem. And you would think it'd be easy to find them, but it can be difficult and expensive. And so a lot of times what we run into is when people are selling property that they want to have someone build on, they don't want to find sinkholes or they don't want to find cave systems below their property because their property value will plummet. So it's not in their best interest. And so they really don't do that. So uh, that can be a problem definitely for um, for Florida or people who live in uh, sinkhole prone areas. And you'll watch the little video on sinkholes and it kind of talks about how Florida is, is dealing with that and uh, I, I thought that was kind of interesting so okay I think uh, I think that's it all right yep that's all we got for today so um, if you have any questions concerns comments feel free to ask